Um, I'm going to start by talking about the faithless electors cases that the Supreme Court had last term, uh, which will almost certainly uh, get us into uh, the opportunity to talk a little bit about some legal issues relating to the presidential campaign. And I guess this is as good a day to be doing that as there, there might be since the first debate is tonight on campus. Um, and then, as Karen said, after the break, um, uh, I'll talk uh, a little bit about, about Justice Ginsburg uh, with some reflections based on, uh, on my clerkship and on uh, my continuing connections with her over the years. Now, um, I, will, uh, I will try to uh, monitor the chat function uh, if you have questions. Uh, please feel free to to put type them in, and I will uh, try to get to as many of, of them as possible. But you know, put them in as they occur to you. Um, so let's start with the faithless electors cases, um, and some basic background. Uh, on election night, uh, 2016, uh, as it became clear that uh, Donald Trump had a projected majority in the Electoral College, uh, some electors decided that they didn't want to vote for the presidential candidate who had carried their state. Uh, the idea was to try to deny Trump an Electoral College majority uh, in hopes that somehow uh, a different, maybe more acceptable president uh, would emerge. Um, the theory behind their move was that the Constitution gives the members of the Electoral College judgment or discretion as to uh, the candidate for whom they're going to vote. Ultimately, seven electors out of 538 cast their votes for candidates other than the ones who carried their states. Uh, two of them were in Texas, they were Republicans. Um, the other five um, were Democrats. Um, four of them were in Washington state. Also, three other electors announced that they would not vote for the candidate who had carried their state. Um, in fact, all of them were Democrats as well. Uh, the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of those folks ultimately changed his mind and wound up voting for Clinton. Uh, the other two uh, stuck to their position and they were replaced as state law authorized. One of those faithless electors was in Minnesota, the other was in Colorado. The dismissed Colorado elector challenged his removal. I mean, basically what he said was that the state law under which he was removed was unconstitutional. Uh, and the lower courts actually agreed with him, uh, saying that he should not have been removed. Um, meanwhile, the faithless electors in Washington were allowed to cast their, their electoral votes, but as state law provided, they were fined $1,000 each. They challenged the fines in, in the state courts. The state courts upheld the fines. So here we have a conflict. We have the Colorado law being held unconstitutional by the lower court, we have the Washington law being upheld as constitutional by the state court. So the case winds up in the Supreme Court. Now, uh, bear with me for a second. I am not a big time um, uh, user of electronics, uh, but bear with me for a moment. Um, what I have on the screen right now uh, is some of the language of Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution, which set up the basic procedure, right? Um, the president is chosen by the Electoral College in which each state gets a number of votes. That number is equal to its, the size of its congressional delegation, two senators and at least one representative. So every state gets at least three votes in the Electoral College. Now, the top line, each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct 
the, the electors, the number of electors to which he was entitled. I have bolded and I've highlighted the in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct because that is potentially significant for this year's election. If you look down at the uh, at the uh, at the next uh, paragraph uh, here, the electors under the original system were supposed to vote for two candidates, uh, and basically, if uh, once the once the votes were counted, um, with each elector having voted for two people, uh, assuming that there were candidates with at least a majority of the electoral votes. The, per, the candidate with the highest number became president. The candidate with the second highest number would be vice president. Now, if it turned out that nobody had a majority, the election would go to the House. We'll come back to that. Um, now, if no vice president emerged from this process, then it would go to the Senate. Now, the system worked pretty, pretty straightforwardly the first two times around because after all, in 1788 and 1792, everybody assumed, as was as was realized, right, George Washington was going to be the president. So there wasn't really a big a big problem. The system worked a little less well in 1796 after Je after uh, Washington chose to retire rather than seek a third term. Um, by then, we had the beginnings of a, a party system, something the framers had not anticipated. And so under the 1796 arrangement, uh, the Federalist John Adams became president because he had the largest number of votes in the Electoral College. And uh, the head of the party that was then called the Democratic Republicans, Thomas Jefferson, became the vice president because he had the second highest number of votes. Now, think about it this way. If this system had been in place in 2016, we would have had President Trump and Vice President Clinton. Um, you don't need to think very hard about how that would have worked. Um, now, as awkward as things were in 1796, the whole system nearly imploded in 1800. The situation in 1800 was a little different. It was clear that the Federalists had been repudiated. The only question was which of the Democratic Republican candidates would be president and which would be vice president. It turned out that the party wanted Jefferson as president and Aaron Burr as vice president, but they didn't coordinate their electors properly. And so both Jefferson and Burr wound up with the same number of electoral votes, which meant that the election went to the House of Representatives. In the House, each state, regardless of the size of its, or the number of its representatives, each state gets a single vote. It took 36 ballots before Jefferson emerged victorious. Do not rely on Hamilton for the details, but, uh, but that's, that's ultimately uh, what happened. Now, because of the, the mess that arose in 1800, um, the, uh, uh, all right, let me stop sharing this for a second because I am uh, not sufficiently together to do this. And let me scroll down and put up uh, uh, a, uh, a screen that, okay. Okay, so here we have the 12th Amendment, which I will put back up in just a moment. Okay. So under the 12th Amendment, the most important feature is that each elector votes separately for president and vice president. Um, and again, um, the, if there is a majority, uh, we know the outcome. If there is not a majority in the Electoral College for president, 
the matter goes to the House of Representatives, again, each state getting one, uh, getting one vote, regardless of the number of representatives. Uh, if no vice presidential candidate has a majority of the Electoral College, goes to the Senate. Now, so now you can see what the faithless electors were up to in 2016. By denying Trump an Electoral College majority, they hoped to throw the election into the House of Representatives for president, uh, but, but it is actually not clear whether that would have made any difference. After all, um, the Republicans had a majority in the House of Representatives, and more to the point, the Republicans controlled 31 state delegations, so almost certainly Trump would have been elected uh, as president. And if the vice presidential uh, race had been thrown to the Senate, the Republicans had a majority there, so almost certainly Mike Pence would have been elected anyway. Put that to one side because that's not what the, what the litigation was about. Um, when the case got to the Supreme Court, uh, the court decided the Colorado case in a one sentence order in which it said, we resolve this case for the reasons stated in the Washington case. Now, why did they do it that way? Well, it turns out that Justice Sotomayor knew the faithless elector in Colorado, and so she did not participate in the Colorado case. Uh, so all of the important aspects of this, uh, of, of, of this issue got resolved in the Washington case, um, where the court unanimously concluded that states could in fact require electors to vote for the candidate who carried their state. Now, uh, Justice Kagan wrote for the court, um, seven justices were subscribed to her opinion. Uh, Justice Thomas concurred, uh, but using somewhat different reasoning that I will come back to uh, in a bit. Um, and uh, Justice Gorsuch uh, con uh, joined the relevant, joint part of Justice Thomas's uh, opinion. So although we've got the two opinions, same conclusion. Now, by way of background, uh, by way of background, um, the Supreme Court has not had much occasion to address the legal issues relating to the Electoral College. Um, the closest case to this one was from 1952. It was a case called Ray against Blair, and it upheld a requirement adopted by the Alabama Democratic Party that any presidential elector on their slate would have to pledge to support the candidate of the National Democratic Party. Now, if you remember uh, back then, that was a reaction to what had happened in 1948. You'll remember maybe that the that Southern Democrats, including from Alabama, walked out of the Na Democratic National Convention because they objected to the civil rights plank in the in the national platform, uh, and they created their own separate party, known colloquially as the Dixiecrats, um, and um, as a result. Uh, Harry Truman was not actually on the ballot in Alabama in 1948. So in 1952, uh, the party decided that uh, it wanted to require anybody who'd be an elector that year to pledge to support whoever the Democrats nominated. Um, now, uh, the Supreme Court upheld that law. By the way, this the, the, uh, up, upheld that requirement. Uh, and by the way, this happened uh, about three months before Alabama Senator John Sparkman was nominated as the Democratic vice presidential candidate to run with Adlai Stevenson. But at that point, nobody knew that was going to happen. Okay, so we have, we have this 1952 case that says that states can require you in advance to pledge. But that's not the case we're dealing with from Washington and Colorado. The other main case involving the Electoral College comes from 1892. It's from Michigan. It's called McPherson against Blacker. And at issue in that case was that at that time, 
the Michigan legislature had passed a law saying that it was going to split its electoral votes, much as Maine and Nebraska do today. That is, the candidate who carried a majority statewide would get two votes in the Electoral College. The rest of the state's electoral votes would be awarded on the basis of who carried each congressional district. Um, and that law was challenged. Ultimately, the Supreme Court upheld the law. Um, but there is some key language in McPherson against Blacker. That opinion says the Constitution does not provide that the appointment of electors shall be by popular vote. It recognizes that the people act through their representatives in the legislature and leaves it to the legislature exclusively to define the method of effecting the object. In other words, and this goes back to the uh, in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct, apparently it would be permissible for the state legislature to ignore the popular vote and simply to award a state's electoral votes to whatever candidate uh, it sees fit. Indeed, uh, back in Bush against Gore, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist emphasized this language uh, as part of his rationale uh, for supporting the stopping of the count in Florida. And we can talk about this later on, but there has already been some discussion that perhaps such a strategy might be used uh, in some swing states um, like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, where there is a Republican legislature uh, and, uh, and a Democratic governor, which raises all sorts of possibilities. Okay, back to the, the case as it, 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 as it came to us. In the Washington case, uh, which is called Chiafalo against Washington, for the, that's the name of one of the faithless electors. In the Chiafalo case, Justice Kagan concluded that both the constitutional text and history supported the notion that states may require electors to vote for the candidates who carry the state in the popular vote. Justice Kagan goes back to that language, right? Article 2, Section 1 authorizes each state to choose electors in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct. So Justice Kagan says that allows the legislature to impose conditions on electors, like you have to vote for the candidate who carries the popular vote in the state. Uh, here, she says, as in the Alabama case in 1952, the state had conditioned an elector's appointment on a pledge to support the party's candidate. Nothing in the Constitution prohibits the states from doing that, although the framers could have done things differently. And here she points to language in the Maryland Constitution that had been adopted in 1776, in other words, 11 years before the federal Constitution, uh, and language in the Kentucky Constitution of 1792, which was after the, the original Constitution, but before the 12th Amendment. In both of those constitutions, the body that was to choose certain other kinds of state officials was told, you get to use your judgment and conscience. Justice Kagan says, the framers of the original Constitution and the framers of the 12th Amendment clearly had these examples in front of them. If they meant to provide for independent judgment by the, by the members of the Electoral College, they could have said so, they did not, and therefore, uh, therefore uh, the, uh, the states have the power to require uh, the electors to vote for the appropriate candidate. Now, the, the uh, electors in this case said, well, there, are, uh, there is language uh, in the Constitution and in, you know, in the original Constitution in Article 2 and in, in the 12th Amendment about electors who vote by ballot. This, they said, implies judgment. Not so fast, says Justice Kagan. Um, people often do not exercise judgment when they vote. 
somebody who votes the way some other person tells them to vote without question is voting even though that person is not exercising independent judgment and there are other circumstances in the law say in proxy voting where someone holds a proxy for another party the proxy doesn't exercise independent judgment the proxy votes the way the principal tells the proxy to vote so even though Hamilton and Jay and other supporters of the Constitution talked about the idea that electors would exercise judgment. That's not in the Constitution, and all we can go by is what is there. Moreover, Justice Kagan says, long established practice suggests that states can limit the discretion of electors. Um, at the outset, voters actually did choose the electors. The names of the electors would be on the ballot, but the electors themselves would say, I am pledged to, I will vote for John Adams, or I will vote for Thomas Jefferson, or whatever. So the, the voters knew exactly whom they were voting for when they voted for the individual electors. And the one faithless elector under that original system in several elections, the one faithless elector was roundly denounced for not voting the way he had pledged to vote. Now, moreover, the 12th Amendment actually made this kind of party line voting safer, Justice Kagan says, because now you vote separately for president and vice president. She cites courts and commentators during the 19th century uh, who recognized that the electors were not exercising independent judgment. They were reflecting the voters' preferences. Um, indeed, by the mid 1800s, um, the names of the electors were no longer on the ballot. You, you saw what our ballots looked like, the presidential candidates, and behind them was a slate. And by the 20th century, a lot of states had laws requiring electors to vote as the um, uh, as they uh, seem to be committed to do. Uh, as of now, at least 32 states require electors to vote for the candidate who carried their state, and 15 of those states actually impose some kind of legal penalty on faithless electors. So according to Justice Kagan, we have a tradition of more than two centuries that electors vote for the candidate the state voters have chosen. Now, the faithless electors here said, well, but we have examples of faithless electors who have never before had their votes rejected. Justice Kagan says, not so fast. All told, there have been 180 faithless electoral votes cast in the entire history of our system. That's 180 out of 23,000. And more than a third of the faithless votes, the, of the 180 faithless votes, were cast in 1872 after Horace Greeley, the Democratic candidate running against President Grant, died between election day and the day that the Electoral College was supposed to meet. Uh, and, uh, and so you don't really count them as significant. Um, but um, uh, the, the uh, court also, uh, Justice Kagan added in a footnote, you know, we're not dealing with a case in which a presidential candidate died between election day and, uh, and the Electoral College day. Um, that's not this case. We'll deal with that if we have to, and presumably they don't, nobody wants the court to be in that position. The elector, the faithless, ele or faithless electors talk about the faithless votes being counted. In fact, only one faithless electoral vote was ever challenged in Congress, um, and that vote was accepted. To which Justice Kagan replies, well, first of all, it's one vote. And in any event, none of the 180 faithless electoral votes 
had any impact on the outcome of an election. Um, so just because a state was willing to tolerate faithless electoral votes and because Congress in one case with one faithless elector decided not to make an issue of it, doesn't, doesn't detract from the basic point, which is that we have this long, unbroken tradition. For more than 200 years, states have restricted the discretion of electors, uh, including through the kinds of pledge laws that are at issue uh, in Washington and you know, presumably Colorado. Uh, those, uh, those laws are consistent with the Constitution, and that's pretty much the end of the case. Now, Justice Thomas agrees that the states are allowed to impose these sorts of requirements. But Justice Thomas says, as far as he's concerned, you get there by a much simpler route. The states generally are free to do anything that the Constitution doesn't bar them from doing. Nothing in the Constitution prohibits states from requiring electors to vote for the candidate who carries the state. End of discussion. Um, now, um, there are other aspects of his, uh, of Justice Thomas's opinion that Justice Gorsuch doesn't, doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't agree with. But the bottom line is we have all nine justices saying that, that laws like the ones in Colorado and Washington that require electors to pledge their vote to the candidate who carries the state uh, and that subject those electors who violate their pledge to legal sanction those are constitutional end of case. Now, let us think about what this means. Um, if this case had come out the other way, and remember the Colorado case did come out the other way in the Court of Appeals, what would have happened? Well, during the oral argument, there was a lot of discussion about the potential for chaos if we had a large number of faithless electors. You don't see any of that in either of the opinions in this case. But if this case had in fact come out the other way, we probably would not have seen the kind of chaos that people were bandying about in the oral arguments. If it turns out that the states could not force can electors to vote for the candidate who carries the state, then presumably the parties would, would much more rigorously screen their candidates for positions in the Electoral College. You want to make sure if you're a Republican that your electors are going to vote for President Trump. You want to make sure if you're a Democrat that your electors will vote for Vice President Biden. So if you don't have any legal kind of leverage over the over the over your electors, then you need to make sure that your people are in fact going to stay on board. Um, but that's that's really hypothetical. We know that that the that the electors this year um, can be, and in most states will be, bound to vote as the popular vote goes. But now I want to go back to the language in um, in uh, both the uh, the uh, Article Two uh, and the uh, uh, and, and in the Twelfth Amendment, but let's let's come back here uh, to the um, to the highlighted language. Uh, again, here the each stage of the point in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct its electors. Well, um, if that's the way the system works. We have a nice question. What happens in Pennsylvania or Wisconsin if, say, the legislature 
which is controlled by Republicans, passes a measure that awards the Pennsylvania or Wisconsin electoral votes to President Trump. And what happens, on the other hand, if there's some question, by the way, about whether the Democratic governors in those states can veto any measure awarding the electoral votes to, to President Trump. Um, but there are Democratic election officials in both states. Um, it is possible that the governor, even if he can't veto the the legislative declaration, the governor might send uh, his own certification that Biden carried the state. So now we have competing sets of, uh, of electoral votes from these states. Uh, and there is uh, all manner of, of potential mischief from there. Um, in the wake of the 1876 election, which in, in which um, it looked like the Democratic candidate, Samuel Tilden, had carried the popular vote and was one vote short of an electoral college majority. Meanwhile, the Republican candidate, uh, Ohio Governor Rutherford Hayes, um, had come in uh, behind Tilden in the popular vote and also behind Tilden in the electoral vote. But there were three, set, three states with uh, disputed electoral college returns. Those three states had just enough votes, electoral votes, that if Hayes got all of them, he would by one vote have a majority in the electoral college. Whereas if Tilden got any of them, he'd have the majority. Well, uh, Congress deadlocked, came up with a, an improvised solution. That was a bipartisan commission. Five senators, five representatives, and five Supreme Court justices. The idea was that there would be seven Democrats, seven Republicans, and one of the Supreme Court justices was an independent. And the idea was probably the Democrats would go for, for Tilden, the Republicans would go for Hayes, and the Supreme Court justice, the independent Supreme Court justice, would essentially break the tie. Unhappily for this plan, uh, while all of this was going on, um, this was a time when state legislatures rather than, than the voters elected senators, and the Illinois legislature elected the independent Supreme Court justice to the Senate. He accepted, therefore he withdrew from the commission, uh, and, and so the fifth Supreme Court justice who was on this commission turned out to be a Republican, and guess what? The commission split on party lines eight to seven to award all of the disputed electoral votes to Hayes. So that's how Hayes got to be president. The, this left a really bad taste in, in a lot of people's mouths. And so in 1887, Congress enacted something called the Electoral Count Act that sets up procedures for processing electoral votes. Now, to be kind, the Electoral Count Act is not the most skillfully drafted piece of legislation. It leaves all manner of potential interpretive uncertainties. And so the bottom line on this is that we do not actually have completely clear ground rules for what happens in a disputed presidential election. That's not really a very reassuring thought at a time when there is widespread distrust of the voting system at a time when, because of the pandemic, an unprecedented number of voters will cast their ballots by mail or by some form of absentee ballot, uh, leaving open lots of possibilities for, for confusion and mischief and uncertainty. Uh, and uh, let's be honest, uh, the, uh, there is, it's, it's really hard to be confident about how things will play out. Now, um, 
Let me stop there. I know there is at least one question. Let me take a quick look at that. But if other people have questions, I am happy to, I am happy to, uh, to entertain them. Okay. So, is there anything in the Constitution that requires a state's members of the House of Representatives to represent specific geographic subdivisions of the state? In other words, do they have to be districted? Or is, is the concept of districts only statutory? Could Congress pass a law requiring proportional representation by party based on a state's popular vote? So if California had 60% of its representatives as Democrats, 35 Republicans, and 5% Greens based on statewide votes? Okay, let's back up. Um, in general, the states decide on how they're on the basis for, for choosing representatives. The states can have all of their members of Congress, if they have more than one congressional, they have more than one seat in the House of Representatives. The, uh, the state could say we're going to draw districts, or the state could say we're going to elect everybody at large. Um, there was a time, um, I think back in the six, late 60s and early 70s, there, there was a time when Ohio had 25 representatives. There were 24 districts and there was one at-large representative. Um, but that was decided by Ohio. It was not decided at the federal level. It's not clear to me that, that Congress could tell any state how to decide on the basis for choosing its, uh, its representatives, other than that the Constitution says you have to elect them. Right? But whether you have districts or at large or some combination, I think is left to the states. Similarly, do we have to have the kind of system we have today that is first past the post? That is, the however many candidates there are, the candidate who has the largest number of votes is declared the winner. That's been the traditional American system. Um, there are places that do not use that. Um, most of the places in the United States that use some kind of, of proportional representation or ranked choice voting tend to be cities or, or towns, uh, and they do this in local elections. But Maine actually does have a system of ranked choice voting. It was recently adopted in Maine. Uh, the reason it was adopted is because Maine, perhaps uniquely among our states, has a tradition of electing independents to office. So right now, for example, one of Maine's senators, Angus King, is technically an independent. He's, he's not a member of either party. He does caucus with the Democrats, but he is not, in fact, a Democrat. Um, there have been independent governors of Maine as well. I think Angus King was, was governor as an independent as well, but, uh, but in any event, um, in, um, in 2010 and in 2014, there was a three-way gubernatorial race in Maine. There was a Republican and a Democrat, and then there was a disaffected Democrat who ran as an independent. The Republican candidate for governor of Maine was a man named Paul LePage, who was, uh, uh, in, in some respects, uh, kind of a, uh, a, f a forerunner of Donald Trump. That is, uh, not very smooth, very abrasive, very outspoken, um, someone uh, who had a core of support among a, a lot of Maine Republicans, although not all of them. Meanwhile, there was a kind of traditional kind of organizational Democratic candidate for governor, and there was this disaffected uh, Democrat who thought that this guy was, this, the Democratic candidate was really uh, not good enough. And so he decided he was gonna run as an independent. So what happened was in the three-way race split almost evenly. LePage came in with about 36% of the vote. The other two split the remaining vote. So, he, so LePage just barely squeaked through. He was a, a bare-knuckled brawler, uh, alienated a lot of people. Um, there was, a, when he came up for re-election in, in 2014, the same guy who had run as an independent the 
previous times that I'm going to run again. This guy is such a bad actor. We ought to be able to knock him out. Well, surprise, surprise. LePage snuck in again by a, by a, a very tiny margin in, a, in a, an essentially three-way split. And the response to that was people in Maine decided, we don't want to go through this again if we can't keep independent candidates from running for, for statewide office. Maybe we can set up a system that of, of ranked choice voting, because if we had ranked choice voting, then LePage would have lost. It's not clear whether the Democrat or the Independent would have won, but surely the people who voted for the Democrat and the Independent would have ranked them one and two and the page three. Uh, and that uh, would have been sufficient uh, for, for one of them to knock off the page. Uh, there actually has been litigation over the proportional or the ranked choice voting system in Maine. Uh, the litigation has failed. The system has been upheld. Uh, and it will be used, uh, I think, in, uh, in this year's election in Maine. So lots of discretion at the state level. Um, now, uh, now the, um, uh, someone has, has added uh, that Oliver Bolton served as congressman at large from, from Ohio in 1962. Um, thank you for reminding me of that. I was thinking uh, at one point that that uh, Robert Taft Jr., uh, uh, that is the son of the, the Mr. Republican, not the son of the more recent governor, uh, but uh, Taft Jr., uh, who defeated Howard Metzenbaum in 1970 for the Senate, um, was, um, uh, was also a congressman at large. Now, um, someone asks, uh, what's the relevance of the Electoral Count Act to the coming election? And the answer is, Maybe a lot. Um, the Electoral Count Act kicks in after the electoral votes are delivered to Congress. Um, and uh, both the Constitution and the Electoral Count Act talk about the votes will be delivered and they will be counted. The, the, uh, we know that uh, under, under these measures that uh, the vice president presides at a joint session of Congress, but it doesn't say who gets to count the votes. Uh, it doesn't say what happens if there is a dispute over, over the electoral college vote from a particular state, if there is one sl slate from the legislature and another slate uh, from the election officials. I mean, there are some things in the Electoral Count Act that are relevant. For example, there is a so-called safe harbor date, which this year is December 14th. Um, this was the this date was also important in Bush against Gore. The Supreme Court actually decided Bush against Gore just as the safe harbor date came into play. And basically, the idea with the Safe Harbor Act is that um, if a state files or it files its its electoral votes by that date then those then those electoral votes are presumed to be correct and valid um, so a lot of things are likely to happen between november 3rd and december 14th we we're hearing a lot about the notion that because of the large number of of vote by mail ballots that uh, we are not going to know on election night necessarily what the outcome is. Um, there's going to be, there's already a lot of talk about, well, mail ballots are somehow dubious or fraudulent or, I mean, the, the actual evidence of fraud in mail votes is, uh, uh, is limited. Um, but that hasn't stopped people from suggesting that, that, the fraud in mail-in uh, voting is is rampant. So we're going to see a lot of uh, a lot of controversy here. Almost certainly, both the Republicans and the Democrats are lining up. Probably have already lined up teams of lawyers uh, in in states where they expect that things will be close. We should not be surprised to see a huge amount of litigation in the run-up 
to the electoral uh, to the uh, to the opening of the electoral votes. Um, and unlike 2000, when the litigation was confined to Florida, there's a good chance that we're going to see litigation in a whole lot of states. So this could be a really, uh, a really kind of messy, uh, a really kind of messy issue. Okay, uh, another question: um, the proposed interstate compact relating to apportioning of, of of electors based on the popular vote. Well, they're they're actually, um, they're actually. The, this, the, the compact that's floating around out there is a little, a little more, a little, is a little different from the way I think it's described. Basically, there, the, there is a proposal that, that states agree to cast their electoral votes for the, the winner of the national popular vote. Now, um, this compact by its terms, um, would even would come into play only when states that together have a majority of the electoral votes, which is to say 270 out of 538. That compact would, would even come into play only when we get to that to to that number to to states with that together have a majority of the electoral college. We are not there yet, and it's not yet clear whether we will get there, number one. Number two, even if we do get there, there is a legal question, there is a constitutional question about whether that compact can come into force without, uh, unless Congress approves it. Now, if Congress has to approve it and we have divided control, you know, the Republicans controlling the Senate and the Democrats controlling the House, that may not happen. Indeed, if we get to the 200 and if we get to, to that point uh, um, and we don't get congressional sign off, but states nevertheless try to proceed in that fashion, there may well be litigation over that. So uh, in any case, that compact is not going to be in place this year, maybe down the line. Another question, why can't we just scrap the Electoral College and go with the, with the popular vote? Well, the short answer is the Electoral College is in the Constitution, and to eliminate the Electoral College, we would have to amend the Constitution. The prospects for a constitutional amendment to do away with the Electoral College strike me as slim to none. In order to amend the Constitution, you got to get two, a two-thirds vote in each House of Congress, and then you got to get three-quarters of the state legislatures to go along. Now, it seems unlikely that we're going to get a two-thirds vote out of both Houses of Congress, but let's say we do. I'd be really surprised if you could get 38 states to ratify an amendment to eliminate the Electoral College. Why? because it is widely thought that the Electoral College um, pr protects smaller states. And by requiring candidates uh, to get some votes um, more broadly around the country. Now, as an empirical question, that's not so clear. I mean, we know that the way presidential campaigns have been running for a while is that most of the small states are ignored. The candidates don't go there. They concentrate on a handful of swing states because they know, bo both parties know that they, can that they can count on winning a certain block of, of states. Not quite enough to get them to 270, but, but enough to lay a good foundation. So they, they spend their time disproportionately in the, uh, in the, in the swing states. Um, but as I said, I think the, whatever, the, whatever the reality, I'd be really surprised if you could get a constitutional amendment ratified by the state legislatures. Now, there is a pr procedure for amending the constitution outside of state legislatures. Um, we could have a constitutional convention to propose an amendment. Uh, that's 
Um, that's how we got prohibition, remember? Um, and Article 5 of the Constitution, which provides for the, the process for, um, uh, for ratifying amendments, allows for conventions in the states uh, rather than the legislature. So, you know, in theory, we could do it that way, but that has almost never been done, and I think is unlikely uh, in the short term, at least, to work here. So I think whatever we might say about the Electoral College, uh, I think we're stuck with it, um, just as a, as, a, as a reality. And, uh, uh, and the question is, how can, we, how can we work within the system that we've got? Now, um, uh, one last question, and then I'm going to, um, uh, then, then we'll take a break. Uh, assuming that the compact came into force, would it be binding on all of the states, even though not all of the states have approved it? No, it would bind only the states that approved it. But again, if that compact doesn't come into play until states that have a majority of the Electoral College sign off, then it doesn't matter whether the other states go along. Because if all of the states, if, if states with a majority of the electoral votes say we're going with the winner of the popular vote, that by itself will give somebody a majority of the Electoral College. Okay. Let's take a break for maybe about 10 minutes and we'll come back. If there, I'm happy to take additional questions on this, uh, but then I'd like to spend a little time uh, talking to you about Justice Ginsburg.
Okay. Um, let's uh, see if we can can regroup. Uh, before before I pick up with Justice Ginsburg, uh, there have been uh, a number of other questions uh, that or, or comments that have come in. So let me try to address that. Um, um, one question is, uh, or one comment is, so amendments to the Constitution are politically impossible. Is, is there a way to adopt a new Constitution? Um, well, I don't know that it is politically impossible to adopt any amendments to the Constitution, um, but it's difficult in general to amend the Constitution. I mean, we've, we've had only 28 amendments total in, uh, in 200 years. Uh, 10 of them came in together as the Bill of Rights in 1791. Um, three more came in during Reconstruction, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Uh, and then uh, we had uh, several more, um, the 16th, 17th, and 18th Amendments uh, during the 19 teens. Um, so yes, it is difficult to amend the Constitution, and that really was by design. Now, of course, there are ways to change the Constitution. Uh, remember that the original Constitution of 1787 was adopted by what you might call a runaway convention. In 1786, uh, there was an agreement that we ought to have um, a convention to deal with problems of the Articles of Confederation, but the delegates to that convention um, instead of tinkering with the Artic Articles of Confederation, they just replaced the Articles of Confederation with the Constitution that we have now. Indeed, there are people who are concerned that if we had a Constitutional Convention today, that we might face the so same sort of, quote, runaway convention that we had back in the 18th century. Uh, and depending on your point of view, maybe that's good and maybe it's not so good, but uh, uh, at least uh, if there is sufficient support, uh, states could, inf and it could in fact call one. Now, um, now uh, we have a question from somebody who is in Pennsylvania or has access to the Pennsylvania ballot saying that the, the uh, presidential electors slot uh, on on the Pennsylvania ballot says, vote for the candidates of one party for president and vice president or insert the names of the candidates, followed by the names Biden, Harris, Trump, Pence, and, and Jorgensen, Cohen. Uh, does this add weight to argu the argument of voters voting for electors and strengthen the argument against the legislature taking control? Well, Yes, it does, but ultimately it seems to me that if push comes to shove, there and let us put aside questions about the, comp, the current composition or the projected composition in the Supreme Court, there is, a, there is a plausible textual reading that says that the legislature can award the electoral votes of its state to one candidate or the other, regardless of whether the voters have, have had their say. Indeed, it doesn't even appear that the Constitution requires that the people vote for the electors. Uh, now, I think that's a plausible legal argument. Whether it is an acceptable political argument is a whole other story. It seems to me that a legislature that says, we don't care what the voters have said, we know better, should be opening itself up to significant political pushback. Now, how much that would translate into being turned out of office at the next election? Well, you know, that depends on how strong party allegiances are and things like that. But, but I think I think we do not want to face the prospect of having the ability of the legislature to award the electoral votes. I don't think we want that. We, I don't think we want that to happen. And I don't think we want that to be litigated. Um, whatever the result, it seems to me, 
uh, that's not a good place for us to be. Um, another question, do all states choose their electors based on statewide vote or do some uh, do so proportionately? And the answer is 48 of the 50 states award their electoral votes on the basis of who wins statewide. Maine and Nebraska, which are small states, but with multiple congressional districts, award their, their uh, electoral votes, not exactly proportionately, but, but, they, but there is the possibility to split. So I think I mentioned before the break, in, in those states, the, the, uh, the candidate who gets the most votes across the state gets two electoral votes automatically. And then the other electoral votes are awarded by congressional district. Um, now, in Nebraska, there's never been a split uh, since they adopted that system. Uh, the Republican candidate for president has carried all three Nebraska congressional districts every time. Um, Maine, on the other hand, had, there has been a split. In fact, in 2016, uh, Trump carried one district, Clinton carried the other, uh, but Clinton carried the one district by a sufficiently larger margin than Trump carried his, that Clinton carried the statewide vote. So, what, so that was a difference of only one vote, although if you've got a close election in the Electoral College, one vote can be dispositive. So the, the short answer is that no, states could award their electoral votes on something like a proportional or, or congressional district basis. There's been some talk about, about doing that. Um, and I haven't looked at this recently, but my impression is that in the past, when people have tried to analyze the impact of awarding most electoral votes by congressional district, I think that the studies have shown that that might help Republicans at least a little bit, but I'm not sure that that's a systematic difference. But what it does mean, for example, is that say a Republican today has no hope of carrying California and, and so gets none of the state's uh, 54 electoral votes. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if, they, uh, if, if the California electoral votes were split by district, then Republicans probably would get you know, maybe 10 or 12 uh, because um, there are pockets of, of Republican strength uh, in California. Um, and uh, similarly, uh, you know, think, about, think about a state like Texas. Um, I know there's some talk that maybe Texas is turning purple, but, but in, in recent decades, Texas has been uh, reliably Republican statewide. But again, there are parts of Texas that vote Democratic. And if Texas split its electoral votes by congressional district, the Democrats would pick up some, some electoral votes there. Now, one of the, one aspect of, of this kind of system is if the, uh, if the districts themselves are gerrymandered, um, then maybe uh, the, uh, the, the electoral votes would, would not be divided in approximately the proportion of statewide vote. I mean, think about Ohio. We have 16 congressional districts, um, and although Trump carried the state fairly easily last last time, he carried it, I think, I think by eight percentage points. In in a number of earlier elections, the, the, the vote here was a lot closer. Remember, President Obama carried Ohio twice. Um, if you look at the at the statewide vote, um, you know, it's for Congress, it's relatively close, but 12 of the 16 congressional districts are Republican and are likely to stay that way. And the other four are likely to stay Democratic. Wisconsin is another kind of an interesting example. Um, there was a litigation in the Supreme Court uh, a few years ago about the gerrymandering, partisan gerrymandering of the state legislature. Um, and in 2018, uh, although the Democrats gained, got the highest percentage of, state, of votes for the state legislature that either party had gotten in 40 years or more, 
the Democrats have barely 40% of the seats in, in each house of the legislature because of the way that the districts were drawn. But that's, that's a separate point from the idea that states presumably could decide to allocate or to award their electoral votes on the basis of something other than who wins statewide. Um, now, um, okay, um, uh, and there, another person raised a question about uh, the possibility that President Trump could in, in, could engage in mischief. I think, uh, I you know, I, I think that's that's probably true. But I mean, that's you know, whatever is going to happen in that regard is going to happen, uh, and uh, I'm not sure that I have anything particular to say about that that you should take seriously. Um, I mean, I think everybody has their own views and I'm not sure that, that, that my views are entitled to any more weight than, than yours uh, in that respect. Okay, um, now um, let, me, let me pivot here for a second and, and, and maybe spend uh, the, pretty much the balance of my time uh, talking about Justice Ginsburg. And, um, for that purpose, let me see if I can do this competently. Um, I'm going to put up a picture. Uh, and this is, this is the picture. Uh, you will see this was, this photo was taken during my clerkship. This is the then Judge Ginsburg. Uh, and here is a much younger um, version. This is a much younger me. Um, uh, the woman standing behind the judge is one of my co-clerks, Monica Wagner, uh, and here's the other co-clerk, uh, Gary Harris. Both of them were students at Columbia Law School. Uh, Monica was also uh, uh, Professor Ginsburg's research assistant, so I was the sort of the odd one out. Uh, this photograph was taken in either late 1981 or early 1982. I don't remember the date. Um, so. We're talking about nearly 40 years ago, and we are all uh, we are all uh, we are all in a different place. So let me say a little bit about my uh, experience uh, with uh, with Justice Ginsburg. Um, and uh, again, I'm happy to uh, to entertain questions along the way. Um, let me start by saying that I was initially skeptical skeptical about clerking at all. Uh, I was one of the oldest people in my class, and I thought I didn't want to uh, didn't want to prolong uh, the process of getting settled as a lawyer, but several of my professors persuaded me to apply, um, and uh, Justice Ginsburg was one of the very few judges to whom I did apply, and I did that because of her work as a scholar, uh, and also as the architect of a remarkable litigation campaign that fundamentally transformed the law of gender discrimination in the United States. And I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, but uh, I actually applied to her before she was confirmed. Uh, and she invited me to for an interview uh, before she was confirmed. Uh, this was the summer after my second year of law school. I was working at a Chicago law firm. Uh, so I arranged to go to New York to meet with her. Uh, I arrived at her New York home shortly after 9.30 in the morning on June 18th, 1980. I will remember the date and, and, I'll, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, when I got to, the, to, to her home, uh, her then 15-year-old son greeted me by saying, I was going to ask you why you want a clerk for an unconfirmed judge, but I can't do that. The Senate just confirmed her a few minutes ago. So I was the first person outside of her family she saw after getting that news. Um, so we talked for a while. She made me the offer. Um, I happily accepted. And that, as I said, that was June of 1980. Uh, she actually was on the bench uh, later that summer. Uh, so I wasn't one of her very first clerks. I started with her in the fall of, uh, or in the summer of, of 81. But even though I wasn't there the first year, uh, she made sure that I was in the loop on what the court was doing. So she arranged for me to receive copies of every decision the court made during my third year of law school, 
so that when I got to her chambers, I'd, I'd be a little bit uh, knowledgeable about what the court had been doing. Now, there were three of us, right? Uh, Gary and Monica and me, and we would divide up the cases that would be argued uh, each month, uh, and we would write bench memos on each case before it was argued. A few days before the argument, we'd meet with the, with the judge to discuss our cases. Now, those memos provided an overview of the case, what the issues were, uh, what had happened before the case got to the Court of Appeals, and she also wanted us to check to make sure that the, that the cases and the statutes on which the parties were relying actually supported the arguments they were making. That, didn't, that wasn't always true, and so she wanted us to flag for her places where the parties were taking liberties. Well, my first bench memo was in a complicated election law case, um, and um, I was uh, a little nervous about this because I said, you know, uh, Monica was, was the judge's research assistant, and Gary and Monica both had been star students for her, and I had no connection to Columbia Law School whatsoever. Um, so um, I worked pretty hard on this. Uh, I wanted to, to make sure that I didn't miss anything. And I prepared a 35-page bench memo, sent it in, and uh, after she read it, she called me and she said, don't do that again. My heart sank. Then she said, this is really good. This is, this is wonderful. But, you know, you can't write memos like this on every case. You will never sleep. Now, considering how little she slept, um, I'm not sure um, quite how to take that. But in any event, we were, you know, we got along fine from there. Um, one other case, just in terms of, uh, that, that sticks out, one other case that tells you something about her uh, was a libel case that was brought against the Washington Post. The case came up to the Court of Appeals on a really arcane procedural issue, nothing to do with the, with the merits of the case. But the briefs were, shall we say, vitriolic. Um, after we discussed the legal issues, the judge remarked about the harsh tone of the briefs. So I said, I have a hypothesis. One of the plaintiffs in this case is George Preston Marshall Jr., whose father was the founder and longtime owner of the team that until recently was known as the Washington Redskins. The Post was represented by a firm called Williams and Connolly, whose senior partner, Edward Bennett Williams, owned the Redskins after Marshall Sr. did. And let's just say that um, Marshall Sr. and Williams detested each other. Williams regarded old man Marshall rightly as an unreconstructed racist. The Redskins were the last team in the National Football League to have a black player. Anyway, I suggested to the judge that the terrible personal relationship between Marshall Sr. and Williams might be reflected in the briefs. She listened very attentively, and then she looked at me and in all seriousness said, what are the Redskins? Now, of course, she had many interests outside of the law. Sports obviously was not one of them. But she was a great boss. Um, she treated her clerks and their families as part of her own family. At the end of each monthly sitting, we would, uh, we would uh, uh, have wine and cheese. After the first sitting, uh, she was mortified to discover that she didn't have a corkscrew in chambers and had to borrow one from one of her colleagues. When the holidays came around, she gave us all very elegant corkscrews so that we would never be caught in her position. She also stayed in touch with us after we left her chambers. For many years, we had annual reunions that drew almost all of the former clerks, spouses, partners, children, the whole works. She was always accompanied by her beloved husband, Marty, uh, an amazing man who was her opposite and also her complement in so many ways. Uh, she was painfully shy. Marty was incredibly gregarious. Um, very funny, uh, and the two of them together just really were a, an amazing couple. Um, at the reunion, she greeted us all individually. She talked to all of us, but 
you know, Marty carried the conversation for the group and had an infinite supply of wonderful stories. Sometimes one of her colleagues would come to the reunion to be kind of the guest of honor. Um, her, her friend and intellectual adversary, Justice Scalia, uh, was the guest of honor uh, at, for her 10th anniversary on the bench. Uh, he was such a success that he was brought back for her 20th anniversary as well. Um, we also stayed in touch. Um, just to give one example, uh, I quoted Marty in a footnote in one of my early articles. While I was clerking uh, um, for, for, uh, for then Judge Ginsburg, uh, Marty testified at a congressional hearing uh, about the 1982 tax bill. Um, one of the things he said appeared in boldface type on the front page of the Washington Post the next day. And by noon, hundreds of silkscreen shirts with that, that boldface quote from the Post had made the rounds at the Internal Revenue Service. Um, I sent the judge a reprint of my article. Uh, I pointed out the footnote and by return mail, I received one of those t-shirts because apparently Marty had been given a stash of them himself. Okay, now, during her entire time on the Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg was in the minority. Most of the justices were appointed by Republican presidents. In fact, when she was appointed in 1993, she was the first Democrat in 26 years to be appointed to the court. Um, nevertheless, she wrote more than her share of opinions for the court over the years, and she was in, in the overwhelming majority of cases, she was actually in the majority, uh, well over 80% of the cases. Um, she also was noticeably faster that, at, at turning out her opinions for the court than any of her colleagues. Um, that, was, that was consistent with how she did things on the Court of Appeals. Um, when, we, when she was on the Court of Appeals, if she had three, if she was working on three opinions at once, she regarded that as a, as a big crisis. Um, for some of her colleagues, if they could get down to three opinions at once, uh, that would be a miracle. Okay, now, um, I want to mention a couple of cases that she did on the, on the, uh, uh, on the DC circuit because uh, they, they reflect something about the way she uh, approached being a judge. Um, one of the cases that she, that she worked on my year, although I did not work on the case, uh, was a case called Chevron. Uh, that's a case that it's a, it, it arose as a complicated environmental law case. Um, as it came to the Court of Appeals, uh, the panel of three judges had to navigate between two somewhat inconsistent lines of DC Circuit precedent. Uh, and that's what the panel tried to do. When the case got to the Supreme Court, the co Supreme Court said, well, we're not, we're not bound by DC Circuit precedent, so we don't have to worry about that. And Chevron became a really major case that said essentially that courts reviewing agency legal interpretations should defer to the agency as long as the agency's position was reasonable. That's been a, a subject of intense controversy. It's not clear to me what's going to happen to the Chevron Doctrine with, with the new justices on the court. But that, that was one really significant case. She did get reversed in that case, but that's what happens with appellate judges. Supreme Court gets the last word. Uh, another important case that she worked on involved the constitutionality of the independent counsel law. Um, now, um, they ca that case, which is known in the Supreme Court as Morrison against Olson, ultimately upheld the validity of the independent counsel law, although it did so over a strenuous dissent by Justice Scalia, who thought that, the, that this decision was a catastrophic error. Um, it turned out that in the Court of Appeals, the Court of Appeals had declared the law unconstitutional. Justice Ginsburg dissented. Now, 
if you only look at the Supreme Court case, Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote for the court, and he, his opinion basically says, you know, this is, we have a lot of interesting little technical legal questions here, and, you know, here's one, and here's another, and, and oh, by the way, yeah, there's this sort of constitutional question lurking in the background, but, you know, we just focus mostly on the, uh, we'll focus mostly on the little technical legal things. Meanwhile, Justice Scalia had said, this is a, this is a case about power and about first principles under the Constitution, and the court has gotten it just egregiously wrong. Well, if you just read those two opinions, it's a rhetorical mismatch. Scalia wins hands down. So you ought to go back to, to then Judge Ginsburg's dissent in the Court of Appeals. Obviously, she didn't, she didn't have Scalia's opinion in front of her. But if you read her opinion, she says, yes, this is a case about first principles. But my first principle is that the Constitution not only separates powers among the branches of the federal government, but it also creates a system of checks and balances to keep any one branch from accumulating too much power at the expense of the others. And so her entire dissenting opinion starts from that first principle and takes on the issues and says, if you follow, if you work from that first principle, this statute, although it may not be perfect, it is certainly constitutional. If you read her opinion against Scalia's opinion, it's not a rhetorical mismatch at all. It's a lot closer case, but that's not the kind of opinion the Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote. But I just mean to suggest that she was very meticulous, very careful, uh, even as she noted, even as she worked really quickly. Now, to the Supreme Court. Probably her most notable opinion there was the VMI case, United States against Virginia, which struck down a mail-only admissions policy. But she also wrote important opinions in other areas. A number of redistricting cases, for example, uh, one uh, in Virginia, which found that a state legislature couldn't appeal uh, a ruling knocking down an apportionment uh, a districting plan uh, if the state attorney general didn't want to appeal. Uh, another um, was a case from Texas called Evenwell against Abbott. It's a 2016 case. In that case, uh, the court, in an opinion by Justice Ginsburg, said that states did not have to apportion their, or didn't have to draw their districts on the basis of citizen voting age population. They could, consistent with the Constitution, do what the overwhelming majority of states do, which is to draw districts on the basis of total population. Now, there's some controversy about whether, about whether we're going to do districting on the basis of total population or citizen population. Uh, President Trump is, says he wants to do it on the basis of citizen population. There already is litigation about that. We'll see how this plays out. Um, Justice Ginsburg also wrote uh, the opinion of the court in an important case that upheld the constitutionality of independent uh, districting commissions uh, to draw uh, district lines. Um, now, she also wrote some important decisions for the court in environmental cases. Um, one dealing with the legitimacy of citizen suits to enforce environmental laws, and another one that found that federal environmental laws uh, prevent or, or, or displace the federal common law of nuisance that some plaintiffs were relying on to challenge carbon dioxide emissions from, uh, from electric power plants. Um, and she also uh, wrote a number of cases involving uh, intellectual property, maybe the most important of which uh, is a case called Eldred against Ashcroft. That upheld the constitutionality of a federal law that extended the term of copyrights. So although she wrote a lot of opinions for the court over the years, uh, she probably will be best remembered for her dissents. One notable example is Ledbetter against Goodyear. Uh, that's a case in which the Supreme Court rejected a claim of gender-based pay discrimination. The court said that the lawsuit was untimely. Uh, Justice Ginsburg strongly disagreed. 
Uh, she uh, rejected what she called the majority's parsimonious reading of Title VII, and she explained in some detail not only why she thought the claim was meritorious, but also why it was timely. She concluded the dissent by saying, well, the ball is now in Congress's court to fix this mistake by, by my colleagues. Uh, the Congress could not, in fact, undo the ruling in the Ledbetter case, but, the, but one of the very first pieces of legislation that, that Congress passed after President Obama was sworn in actually amended Title VII so that cases like Ledbetter would be timely uh, going forward. Um, she also um, will be, I think, uh, very well remembered for her dissenting opinion in Shelby against Holder. That's a case in which the majority of the court uh, essentially eviscerated a, a key feature of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and uh, again, um, Justice Ginsburg's dissent took on Chief Justice Roberts' majority opinion in virtually every particular. Um, you can capture uh, her, her view by this one sentence. Throwing out the provision that the court is throwing out in this case, when that provision has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes, is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. Now, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a national, was a figure of national stature when she became a judge. She would have been an important person even if she never sat on the Supreme Court or on the DC Circuit for that matter. In that sense, she was similar to Thurgood Marshall, to Oliver Wendell Holmes, to William Howard Taft, and a few other people who had distinguished careers before they got on the Supreme Court. Before she became a judge, Ginsburg was a leading legal scholar. She wrote extensively on procedure and jurisdiction, as well as on constitutional law. Um, among her scholarship, uh, she taught herself Swedish after uh, she got out of law school um, so that she could do some research on Swedish law. That resulted in three books. And uh, she used to have on the wall of her chambers the diploma she, re she received from the King of Sweden, an honorary degree from one of the leading Swedish universities recognizing her, her work. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, she led a litigation campaign that resulted in a series of Supreme Court decisions that just completely transformed the law of gender discrimination. Before she started her work, the court in its entire history had never struck down a sex-based law as unconstitutional. Uh, when, she, uh, when, when she got done, the law looked really different. So uh, she changed the law both in cases that she argued and in cases in, uh, where she advised other lawyers. She was a brilliant lawyer and a shrewd strategist, as shown by her enthusiasm for sometimes using male plaintiffs as part of her litigation strategy. And she brought that strategic sense to the Supreme Court, especially when she became the most senior member of the liberal group on the court in 2010. She helped to keep the, the group united in some high profile cases. And sometimes her strategic instincts were don't say anything, right? Even when there was plenty to say. Take for instance, Obergefell against Hodges, the same sex marriage case from 2015. Yeah, that was a five to four decision. Justice Kennedy wrote for the court and his opinion was, shall we say, unconventional. Um, but Justice Ginsburg did not write a word. She thought, I think, I don't have this on, on direct authority, but I, knowing her, I think that her view was, it was better just to leave Justice Kennedy's opinion out there and not undercut the force of the decision by essentially quibbling with the reasoning. And not only did she not write, but I think one way or another, she may have gotten the other uh, justices, Breyer, Sotomayor, and, and Kagan uh, to refrain from writing. Uh, and something similar happened last term in, in Boston. That's the case in which the court said uh, that uh, that Title VII prohibits discrimination based on sexual orientation and, and transgender status. Uh, 
Justice Gorsuch wrote for a six to three court. Um, he took one particular approach to statutory interpretation. There are others, almost certainly, some of the other justices in the majority would have would have followed one of some other of those approaches. They didn't say anything. Again, the idea I think was to avoid undercutting the force of the decision. Um, now, um, I guess to me this suggests that Justice Ginsburg's legacy, despite all of the things that she did on the bench, her, her legacy as a justice might be a little bit like Holmes's more famous for her dissents than for the, the many opinions that she wrote for the court. But I also want to, to conclude by saying something about her national stature before she went on the bench. She was confirmed unanimously for the DC circuit and virtually unanimously for the Supreme Court. That would never happen today. We know that. The parties are much more polarized than they have been in the past. Um, and uh, ideological reliability seems to be the most important thing for, um, for both parties uh, in filling Supreme Court nominations. So the field of acceptable candidates tends to be defined in terms of prior service on a federal court of appeals because that's where you can make a track record. So the combination of polarized parties and the ability of a simple majority uh, of the Senate to confirm a nominee suggests that, that uh, Supreme Court appointments are not helping but maybe contributing uh, to the, the uh, extent of, of political conflict. So let me wrap up by saying that I think that Ruth Bader Ginsburg might be the last widely recognized figure of national stature to be appointed to the Supreme Court. And I think that maybe she's going to be the last one for a long time. Um, the current polarization raises the question about, about what does it mean to talk about a rule of law and an independent judiciary? So I'm, I, I hope I'm wrong about, about this, but you know, I'm, I'm saddened about, about her passing, not because, just because she was my judge, but also because I think that both the Supreme Court as an institution and the country as a whole uh, you know, are, at, are in a bad place. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure how we, how we move things forward, but uh, um, that's kind of where I see things. And let me stop here and find out if, uh, uh, if, if people have questions or comments or, or objections or whatever. Okay, I am not, I am not seeing comments at this point. Um, I realize that this is the last segment of a long, uh, of a long series, um, and uh, so um, if we don't have questions, let me again thank there you. Are, are, pardon me. John, yeah. I'm sorry that if you click on the chat button, do you, uh, there there were some questions. I have been I've been looking down there. I'm not seeing. Huh. Uh, Okay. All right. Okay. I see there are some. Okay. I, I, I see there are some. I, I, I apologize. Okay. Uh, let me, let me take a quick look. Okay. Um, so one question uh, is about uh, Judge Barrett. Uh, does she have experience that matches previous nominees? Um, well, she has experience for uh, nearly 20 years as a law professor. Uh, she hasn't been a federal court of appeals judge for all that long, but um, she's been there for three years. That's longer, say, than Justice Thomas was a court of appeals judge when, when he was nominated by uh, the first President Bush. Um, it is less time on the bench than Justice Kavanaugh or Justice Gorsuch had, um, but um, they had different career paths. I mean, 
just, uh, Judge Barrett um, had spent most of her time as a, as a law professor uh, before she was appointed to the Seventh Circuit. Um, I don't know Judge Barrett. Um, I know that her mentor uh, is a man named John Garvey, uh, who is now the president of Catholic University of America, but I've known John Garvey for 30 years. He is one of the smartest and most humane and thoughtful people I know. And he always said that, uh, that Judge Barrett was the best student he'd ever taught. And he's been teaching now for about 45 years. Um, so uh, on paper, uh, she seems to, to have a lot, of, uh, a lot of impressive credentials. I mean, not only, you know, terrific law student, uh, Supreme Court clerk, um, you know, had, had a, a track record as a legal scholar. Now, not everybody will agree with her views, and, and she clearly was, was selected uh, in part, in large part, because she was expected uh, to uh, take, uh, to, to side with one approach to, to the law. Um, so, uh, you know, I think if you're just looking at, at say, uh, professional or intellectual qualifications, uh, she seems to, to, have, uh, to have those. Um, by the way, um, she gave a lecture at our law school uh, in 2019. Uh, the most recent edition of our law review, which is not out in hard copy, but is online. Uh, if you go to the law school website uh, and you look up the law review uh, page, um, you'll find her lecture there, and I, uh, I commend that to your uh, attention. Now, um, now um, uh, I, there's also a question, uh, what do I think about Judge Barrett? I don't think that, that I should say much about Judge Barrett. I mean, let's put it this way. Uh, I knew Justice Ginsburg for 40 years. Um, and we were, you know, I worked closely with her. We stayed in touch. Uh, I can't, I don't think anybody could replace Justice Ginsburg, no matter which party. Uh, and, and I think it would come with ill grace of me to, to, to get into uh, where I might differ uh, from, from Judge Barrett. Um, now, um, uh, I do think that we're, the process that we are going through is not going to help the court or the country. Um, I think that it comes with um, ill grace for Senator McConnell to be trying to draw Talmudic distinctions between 2016 and 2020. Uh, I will tell you for what it's worth that um, I have an article that was uh, that appeared early this year in Ohio history about a Supreme Court appointment in an election year. It was 1916. Uh, Charles Evans Hughes resigned from the Supreme Court so that he could accept the Republican presidential nomination to run against Woodrow Wilson. Uh, if ever there was an argument that we should leave the seat open uh, pending the outcome of the election, that was it since if Hughes won you know, it's Hughes's seat, whatever. Um, moreover, if the Republicans who were in the minority in the Senate had, had been so inclined, they could have blocked any appointment. There was no way to end debate in 1916. There was no, there was no rule about limiting debate in the Senate. And it isn't like the Senate uh, just went along with anybody the president nominated for the Supreme Court. 1916 was also the year that Wilson nominated Louis Brandeis. And you might remember that until the Senate stonewalled Judge Garland four years ago, the more than four months from nomination to confirmation for Brandeis was the longest delay that we had ever had. Um, so there were all kinds of reasons why if the Republicans wanted to, they could have blocked Wilson, even though they didn't have the votes to defeat Wilson's nominee. By the way, the nominee was, was a federal judge from Cleveland named John Clark, 
uh, who was a graduate of Western Reserve College, class of 1877. Um, but, you know, that's a piece of local history. Um, that article uh, I just uh, was asked over the weekend uh, to see if I could reprint the article in a, in a law review, a special issue of, a, of, of the Cardozo Law Review in New York, and we're in the process of doing that. Um, so I do think that, that, that it's hard to square Senator McConnell's position in 2016 with his position in 2020 if we're talking about some sort of, of high principle. But of course, Supreme Court appointments are not matters of high principle. They're intensely political. They've always been had a political aspect to them. And I think what we can see is that because Supreme Court appointments are intensely political, because the parties themselves are in such different places, and because the Senate rules, which are there in part because of moves that the Democrats made uh, in 2014, right? it is now possible for one unified party with, with a simple majority to push through pretty much anybody. And that's essentially what we are seeing now. I don't think that that is good for the court. I don't think it's good for the country, but I think it is political reality. Um, and so uh, as, as, as unhappy as I am about, about that, and I would be unhappy about that, whoever the nominee might be, um, you know, I, we are where we are. I think it is, it, it is almost inevitable that Judge Barrett will be confirmed. She will probably be confirmed by, by an almost party line vote. Um, uh, I don't know whether all of the Democrats will vote no, but virtually all of them will. Uh, we know that uh, Senator Collins and Senator Murkowski had expressed opposition to going forward. We'll see whether they vote no, but even if they do, the Republicans will have enough votes to get Judge Barry confirmed, and it looks like they are they are determined to get her confirmed before the election. Um, and um, you know, I mean, I think as un as unfortunate as as this process is, um, I don't know that there's any really effective way of stopping it. One other thing, um, the, you know, there have been suggestions that if the, if, if Biden wins and the Democrats keep control of Congress, that the, that the Democrats should try to pack the Supreme Court. I get that, that idea, um, but I think it is a bad idea. And, uh, I, there's nothing cast in concrete about the size of the Supreme Court, although the court has had nine justices for more than 150 years. Um, but two can play at this game. You know, if the Democrats decide we want to pack the court because we've had seats stolen from us, um, they'll do that, maybe. You think the Republicans are going to sit, sit quietly by? If the Democrats pack the court when they have the White House and Congress. What do you think the Republicans are going to do when they have the White House and Congress, whenever that comes around? I mean, and and eventually we will be at a point where we're saying, we're basically saying uh, that whoever controls the political branches gets to determine the size of the court in order to predetermine the outcomes of cases that they, that they care about. Um, well, you know, as, as Karen said earlier, when she was introducing me, I do have an appointment in political science. Uh, I'm not naive about the politics of, of the law, but the law is about more than politics. And it seems to me that if we get bogged down in, in partisan gamesmanship like this, that instead of saying that, yes, at some level, politics affects the law, we are basically saying that, that, polit that the law is only about politics. And when we get to that point, what possible reason do any of us have, whether we're lawyers or not, to respect courts and the law? And that, it seems to me, puts us in a simply dreadful place. Uh, I don't want to think about that, but I'm afraid that we've, that's a place to go. Maybe this is the best that the Democrats can come up with as a political response. I am not a 
you know, despite my political science appointment, I am not a sophisticated political operator uh, or strategist. I don't know, but you know, I would like to think that there are better responses than court packing, uh, ones that might actually have some greater chances for long-term success. Now, okay, um, a question about, about Justice Ginsburg's close friendship with Justice Scalia. Was it surprising? Mm, well, it not necessarily. Let, let me put it this way. Justice Scalia was actually not on the Court of Appeals during my clerkship, um, but Robert Bork was on the Court of Appeals. And I can tell you that, uh, that Judge Ginsburg was delighted to have Judge Bork as a colleague, not because she agreed with him, but because she said he is smart and therefore you can have a really serious, thoughtful discussion and debate with him, which she found to be more difficult with some of her less intellectually talented colleagues. And that was true, by the way, not just of, of Republican colleagues, but even some of her Democratic colleagues. So in that sense, I'm not surprised. Scalia was certainly very smart. They had a lot of things in common together. Uh, I mean, I will tell you, I mentioned earlier that, that uh, for, her, for the uh, reunion for her 10th anniversary on the bench, Justice Scalia was brought, was invited to be the guest of honor. And in fact, um, uh, he began by saying that, that whoever it was who'd invited him uh, uh, encouraged him to roast Ginsburg. And he said, um, I can't do that. Roasting Ruth Ginsburg is like roasting Queen Victoria. But, he said, you know, there's another Ginsburg. And then he turned to Marty, who, as I said, was very outgoing and wildly funny. And so uh, Scalia then spent the next 10 minutes skewering Marty, and both Ginsburgs howled. Um, I mean, they were, they were very, very close. Um, maybe the best way to capture this is um, Someone once said, friendship is more important than ideology. And I think for, for the relationship between Justice Ginsburg and Justice Scalia, that was true. Justice, friendship was more important. But that didn't keep them from going at, you know, from disagreeing strenuously in particular cases. I mentioned the VMI case uh, early on because that, that's probably the single Supreme Court decision that for which Justice Ginsburg is likely to be remembered for opinion of the court. Justice Scalia alone dissented in that case, and it was a typical Scalia slash and burn take no prisoners dissent. Uh, there's even a footnote in his opinion in which he, he chastises uh, the court for not realizing that there is no campus at the University of Virginia. There, there are grounds. But if you read that footnote, that was clearly a direct personal attack. Even then, you know, Scalia couldn't help himself, but he didn't harm the friendship. Uh, she was quoted in one interview as saying that there were times when she felt like strangling Scalia because of something that he, he wrote in an opinion, but, she, but he was still her friend. And so for people who can separate ideology from friendship, more power to them. Frankly, there are so few people in high places in our country these days who can do that, that I think this is great. A lot of the, you know, I was a lot more sympathetic to, to Justice Ginsburg's approach to things than, than uh, Justice Scalia's. But, uh, you know, I have taught cases that both of them wrote over the years, and it's a pleasure to teach those cases because you can tell what they're saying. You can tell how they're reasoning things out, right? And, and you can tell at the end of the day that as strongly as they feel, these things are not ultimately personal to them in the sense that they're going to hold it against their colleague for being, quote, wrong. So um, 
I think I have exhausted your time. And so let me, let me stop here. Let me thank you for your patience sitting through this program with me and for going through the programs, uh, the earlier programs uh, with my colleagues. And, and I hope that we will be able to uh, do a series like this uh, next year. Uh, but with any luck, we'll be able to do it in person. So thank you all and uh, take care.